Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stupid History Podcast. As usual, I'm your host Tintin. Today, we will talk about a drink that took the world by storm in the 17th and 18th century. Still consumed worldwide by a large number of people, it remains one of the favorite drinks in the world. Yes, I am talking about tea. Now, when you say tea, three prolific tea drinking cultures instantly come to mind. China, Great Britain, and of course, our very own India. Our story today brings these three tea drinking cultures together through a blunder committed by the East India Company and their early tea planters in India in the 19th century. To find out what and how, keep listening. Our story begins on the night of 13th of May 1662 at the port of Portsmouth in southern England. A flotilla of 14 British warships had sailed into the harbor. On board of on one of them was Catherine Braganza, the daughter of King Juan IV of Portugal. And she was also the future queen of the British king Charles II. Along with Catherine came a rich dowry of exotic spices and sugar brought from the Portuguese colonies of South and Southeast Asia and the Caribbean. Along with that came 250,000 pounds in hard cash. There was also a gift of an insignificant island named Bombay located on the west coast of India. Along with all of these came a chest of tea. That was a personal possession of Catherine herself. She was a tea addict. Over the next few decades, Tea drinking caught on among the most elite circles in England. Gradually, within a century, tea drinking became more democratized and its popularity soared among the common Englishmen and women. The supply of tea in England could not keep up with its increasing demand, though. At the time, China was the sole producer of tea and they supplied tea to the whole world. Portuguese, Dutch, English and other European traders vied for a piece of this Chinese tea market. In the early 18th century, the East India Company, thanks to their connections in high places, were awarded the sole monopoly to import tea in England. But the tea imported by them was always comparatively highly priced compared to the black market tea imported by their closest rivals, the Dutch. While the Dutch East India Company bought tea directly from the Chinese markets, the British East India Company bought tea from independent Chinese and European tea merchants. These tea merchants brought Chinese tea to Calcutta, where the company bought it from them. This tea was then exported to Britain on East India Company ships and auctioned off to various tea merchants in England. Depending on middlemen to buy Chinese tea meant that the company had to bear the extra cost which was passed on to the customers, making their tea comparatively expensive. As a result, many British tea dealers turned to tea smugglers who purchased the same Chinese tea in cheaper prices from the Dutch markets to sell them in England. The East India Company was always very defensive about its tea monopoly. So it used its massive financial power and influence to pass strict legal restriction on tea smugglers in England, many of whom were arrested and put to death. In India, the East India Company supervised and enforced their monopoly with full force. Any potential rivals in the tea market were quickly and violently rooted out. A major threat towards their monopoly came not from their traditional business rivals, though. They did not come from the Portuguese, the French, or the Dutch, but it came from the British individuals. This was the golden age of explorations for British botanists and naturalists. Their research interests in exotic flora and fauna took them to faraway corners of South and Southeast Asia. Some of them had even been to the tea-growing areas of Yunnan province in southwestern China. They went there in disguise and had collected samples of tea saplings and seeds, which were sent for scientific study to botanical gardens in Calcutta and London. Many of these botanists then came to India where they explored its remote northeastern hills and found a climate which they thought 
might be suitable for cultivating tea indigenously. One such amateur botanist was Major Robert Bruce. He had already spotted tea growing naturally in the highlands of Assam in 1823 and had collected some seeds which he sent for analysis at the Calcutta Botanical Gardens. The East India Company realized in horror that if they allowed these findings by individual scientists to circulate, it was only a matter of time before private entrepreneurs, both British and non-British, started experimenting with tea cultivation in India. And if they were successful, that would mean the death of the East India Company's tea monopoly. Therefore, the company did what they did best. To defend their monopoly in Chinese tea trade, they downplayed and, where possible, covered up these researches. They also actively discouraged any experiment with tea at the botanical gardens in Calcutta. But then came a massive blow from the British Parliament. In 1833, the East India Company's charter was again up for renewal after 20 years. The Parliament renewed the company's charter for another 20 years, but then they also turned the company into a primarily administrative body, which would only be in charge of administering its territories in South and Southeast Asia. Their tea monopoly was abolished. Now, any Englishman could legally import and sell Chinese tea in Britain. This shut down a major avenue for the profit of the East India Company. While the company's directors in England were shell-shocked, the Governor-General in India, Lord William Bentinck, acted swiftly. In 1834, he instituted the Indian Tea Committee in Calcutta with three members, George Gordon, James Pattle, who is also the great-great-grandfather of author William Dalrymple, and Dr. Lum Kwa. This committee was in charge of finding ways to smuggle Chinese tea seeds from Yunnan to India, where they would start experimentally planting tea in northeast and the Himalayan hill stations of Mussoorie, Dehradun, as well as South Indian hill station of Uti. At the time, Darjeeling was not yet under the East India Company's control. Dr. Lum Kwa was a rich and famous Chinese physician in Calcutta. He had earned a name for himself for helping Reverend Marshman, one of the Sirampur Baptist Mission Trio, to translate the New Testament into Chinese. He had also been inducted as the first Chinese member of the Asiatic Society of Calcutta and had donated his entire collection of valuable Chinese manuscript to the society. Accomplished as he was, Dr. Lum Kuo's appointment to the Tea Committee was rather curious. He was appointed on the committee based on a false and rather stupid premise by the East India Company. Lord Bentinck and his advisors in Calcutta believed that Chinese people had an inherent racial quality of being expert tea cultivators. They thought that you could literally pick up anyone with a Chinese ancestry from anywhere in Southeast Asia, and even if they had not been within a thousand miles of a tea plantation ever in their life, they would still inherently be able to cultivate tea. Now let that sink in. As an influential member of the Chinese community in Calcutta, Dr. Lum Kwa's role in the committee was to convince other members of the Calcutta's Chinese community to relocate to the Northeast to help the East India Company set up this first Indian tea plantation there. Now, I'm not sure how Dr. Lum Kwa felt about all of this, but given that he was going through an acute financial crisis at the time, the appointment was a boon for him. As Gordon and Patel got to work trying to learn as much as they could about Yunnan tea and exploring possible ways to smuggle tea seeds into India, Lum Kwa also got to work in Calcutta's Chinatown. Calcutta has one of the oldest Chinatowns outside Southeast Asia. A Chinese community from Canton had started living permanently in the city since at least the 1780s. And by the 1830s, there were no less than 500 Cantonese living in Calcutta. Dr. Lum Kwa used his influence within the community to start his recruitment campaign. Initially, no one signed up. None of the community members had ever heard of Assam and they did not want to venture into this unknown land. After trying very, very hard to cajole them into joining for six long years, 
he finally got 18 Cantonese volunteers. There was one problem, though. Although they were prolific tea drinkers themselves, none of them had ever seen a tea plantation before. Their skills lay in carpentry and not tea cultivation. This minor fact was overlooked, though, and Dr. Lum Kua was soon appointed as the superintendent of the newly formed Assam Tea Company's new tea estate in Sadia, in eastern Assam. Along with the 18 original recruits from Calcutta, Lum Kua also asked the East India Company to recruit anyone who had any Chinese ancestry and was willing to travel to India from the Southeast Asian ports. Finally, the company recruited and sent 105 Chinese laborers who were originally working as porters along the ports of Malaya Peninsula to join Lum Kua's party. Again, none of them had any experience or any exposure to tea plantations or tea cultivation. Dr. Lum Kua and his party of 123 Chinese plantation pioneers left for Sadia in the summer of 1840. As the boat traveled north along the Brahmaputra River, some racial slurs were exchanged among the Chinese and the locals, leading to occasional skirmishes along the way. After the first batch reached Sadia, the company sent word to Lum Kua that they had recruited 247 more laborers with Chinese ancestry from Malaya and were sending them up to him. Once again, they were just laborers and did not have any exposure or experience in tea plantation in China. As their boat made its way up river and stopped for rest at Pabna, a town in modern-day Bangladesh, again some racial slurs were exchanged with the locals and a full-fledged fight broke out in the town. Two local inhabitants were killed and many were injured. Four Chinese were arrested. The rest of the party refused to continue their journey if their friends were not released. The British East India Company had had enough. They had realized the hard way that bringing laborers from Southeast Asia and settling them in the innermost hamlets of Assam was not going to work due to fundamental differences in language, culture, and food habit. They sent the entire second group of 247 Chinese back to Calcutta, from where they were deported wholesale to Mauritius. Much of the thriving Chinese community in Mauritius today traces their origin from this first group of Chinese settlers. They were originally recruited by the East India Company as expert tea planters and sent to Assam, and that did not work out. When the company thought that things could not turn any worse, it did. Dr. Lum Kwa suddenly contracted Kala Azar, a type of jungle fever, and died at Sadia on 14th August 1840. When an Englishman was appointed as his successor, he quickly discovered that none of the original 123 Chinese tea experts brought to Sadia by Dr. Lum Kwa had any clue about how to cultivate tea. The company had wasted six long years because of their faulty belief that expertise in cultivating tea was somehow related to an inherent racial quality among the Chinese. Thank you very much everyone for listening. Do let me know what you thought about this episode. Subscribe to the Stupid History Podcast on Spotify or Podbean. You can also follow the Facebook page and YouTube channel of Heritage Walk Calcutta to listen to more podcasts or watch more videos. To support our research at this trying time of global pandemic, please make a donation on patreon.com slash heritagewalkcal. That is patreon.com forward slash heritagewalkcal. Thank you. Stay home. Stay safe and keep smiling. I will see you next week.